Thank you. Uh, and what I'd like to uh, do today is uh, give you a lecture, uh, talk a little bit about uh, an area of research uh, and uh, scholarship that is uh, near and dear to my heart, something that I have a great deal of interest in, uh, police shootings in America. The topic uh, and the title, I guess, of my presentation will be Crime, Guns, Trust, and Fear, When Police Kill Citizens in America. My name is Stephen M. Schnebley. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Springfield. And before I get into what I would like to uh, give a lecture on today, I would like to just briefly introduce myself so that you know uh, who it is you're listening to. I do apologize in advance for not having the webcam up and functioning. Uh, this is the very first online lecture that I've ever given, and I encountered a few technical difficulties. So unfortunately, you will just have to know me by my voice, uh, and uh, if you would like to know what I look like, you could always Google me. Uh, and then perhaps in my many trips to uh, Valencia, perhaps someday I, I could meet some of you. That would be wonderful. Uh, just a brief thing on my background, uh, I have a PhD in criminology and criminal justice. Uh, I earned that in 2005 from the University of Missouri-St. Louis, uh, one of the top-ranked criminology schools here in the United States of America. Uh, as soon as I graduated, uh, I went straight to Phoenix, Arizona, where I spent four years as an assistant professor in the School of Criminology in Criminal Justice. Uh, I taught there. Uh, I did research there. We had a master's degree program, again, uh, another top school in, in the discipline of criminology. Uh, at present, uh, I'm in Springfield, Illinois, um, the land of Lincoln, home of Abraham Lincoln, where I'm an associate professor, uh, a tenured professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Um, that's a little bit about me, I guess a little bit more. Um, we can talk about about uh, what my research and teaching interests are, where I come from academically, intellectually. Uh, I've conducted a, a variety of criminological research uh, on various topics. My doctoral dissertation covered the topic of uh, citizen crime reporting using victimization data. Uh, I've conducted quite a bit of research on policing, uh, in particular community-oriented policing. Uh, I've done some research on firearms, guns, uh, as you'll see later on in my talk today. Guns are a important topic when we talk about police shootings and crime and violence in America. In particular, I've done some research on whether or not guns uh, can be used successfully uh, in self-defense and how uh, the levels of success vary across uh, gender, age, income, etc. And I've also done some research on gangs, another big problem in American crime and criminal justice. Uh, I've looked at citizens' fear of gangs. I've looked at levels uh, of gang membership across neighborhoods uh, and a few other uh, areas pertaining to gangs. So that's my research. Uh, my teaching focus uh, at present tends to uh, focus on the core components of social science uh, in the criminal justice program here at the University of Illinois Springfield. I teach uh, the research methods course occasionally. I teach statistics. I've taught criminological theory in the past. At present, I'm teaching an online gangs, crime, and violence course. Uh, I teach the Introduction to Criminal Justice Systems in America course. I also teach an online uh, international criminal justice systems course where we compare criminal justice in countries like America to those in England, France, Germany, China, and a variety of other locations. And then lastly, uh, one of my new favorite courses I teach uh, is on the death penalty. Uh, America is one of those countries that uh, nationally still possesses the death penalty despite international movements to abolish. Uh, although, as again, I will talk about a little bit later, uh, America is slowly moving towards the abolition of the death penalty as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. And, and uh, let's get to what I'm here to talk with you about today, which is this idea uh, of America's large number of citizens who are killed by our police force. Uh, in American news media, we hear about this on, in essence, a daily basis about how our citizens are being shot and killed. Um, many times the incidents involve uh, citizens, supp uh, supposed criminals, attacking the police and the police acting in self-defense. Uh, but in many other instances, we have incidents where uh, the individual who is shot and killed by police is unarmed uh, and did not appear to be resisting the police in any way, shape, or form. At the very least, when the police use lethal violence against citizens, uh, it's something that the public needs to know about. Uh, 
Uh, we need to study it scientifically. We need to possess the ability to understand the phenomenon, um, to predict it, uh, and ideally to prevent it. We don't want our police killing citizens when they do not have to. So one of the first things that any good social scientist will do is ask the question, how many citizens are killed by police in America? And that's a difficult question to answer because the United States government does not collect comprehensive data on the number of citizens killed by law enforcement agents each year. Uh, that's not to say the federal government doesn't collect any data. Uh, as we'll see in, in the next slide, there, there are some elements of data the government collects. But because American criminal justice is largely local, uh, that is, it is, it is administrated uh, and it functions at the local level, this is especially the case for police, uh, because of this locality, local agencies do not always come together to share their data, and thus there are no good, uh, at least there have been no prior, good estimates of how many citizens are killed by police. And this is a shame because the American government is very good at counting things. In fact, the, the American government spends a great deal of money and exerts a great deal of effort to comprehensively count numerous things, uh, some that seem much, much less important, in fact, than how many of our citizens are killed by police in the line of duty. So some of the things American, uh, the American government counts effectively are things like the acres of corn planted. Uh, it doesn't take much research uh, effort to find that there are 88.9 million acres of corn planted approximately in America each year. Uh, another thing the, uh, the government counts is, and again, a seemingly less important thing than police shootings, is the annual symphony attendance. How many Americans attend symphony uh, orchestra concerts each year. That number is 25.6 million. Um, we even count in America the number of what are called Botox procedures. Uh, I'm not sure how common Botox procedures are in Europe or, or Spain in particular, uh, but for those of you not familiar with what Botox is, uh, here it is. It is a process whereby men and women uh, receive injections of the botulism toxin which paralyzes nerves and in turn uh, kills them, uh, paralyzes them for a short term, uh, and makes you look younger by removing wrinkles. In fact, the American government, uh, through its uh, very labor-intensive efforts and, and resource expenditures, uh, knows with a great deal of certainty that there are 3.7 million of these Botox procedures in America annually. Despite these three pieces of data, uh, acres of corn planted, symphony, uh, attendance and Botox, there is no federal government database that counts the number of citizens killed by police. And that is a major, major problem. It's limited social scientists' ability to study police violence and police killings, uh, and it's limited the ability of the American public to understand how impactful the phenomenon of police shootings and police killings actually is. As I said before, the government does collect some data on the number of police shootings in America, but unfortunately, these data are incredibly limited. Uh, the data are actually collected by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, our, our world-famous FBI, as it's referred to. Uh, and the FBI collects these data from what are called the uh, number of justifiable, ho justifiable homicides in uh, the what are called supplementary homicide reports. Now, the supplementary homicide reports are part of a broader data collection process called the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, uh, which produces each year an annual document called Crime in the United States. I'll actually be sharing with you some of these UCR, Crime in the United States, data shortly. Um, the problem with these counts of justifiable, justifiable homicides um, is that they possess uh, a great, well, excuse me, not a great deal, very little uh, validity, uh, and, and not a great deal of reliability either. The annual estimates uh, that the FBI produces uh, for the number of citizens killed by police each year range substantially. That is from 150 on the low end uh, all the way up to 500 on the high end. Now, the reason for this enormous level of variation is one that's incredibly problematic for those who want to study uh, the number of citizens killed by police. And that problem is that local agencies... Uh, can choose whether or not they want to submit their data to the FBI. Uh, in other words, if you're a local department and you have shot and killed several citizens and you believe that uh, for public relations reasons you don't want to report that, you do not have to. 
Uh, so what we find is that because of the voluntary nature of, of local police agency performance, what we end up with uh, are counts that are unquestionably much, much lower than the actual number of citizens shot and killed uh, by the police each year. In fact, I teach, as I mentioned earlier, an introduction to criminal justice systems course in America where we talk about policing, courts, uh, and prisons as the three main topics. Now, in that course, I use a textbook that actually cites the number 150 to 250 uh, killings per year. Uh, again, we know these numbers are far too low, and we have to figure out some way to get more accurate estimates. And the good news is that there are new sources of data out there. They've come into being in the last, uh, realistically, six, seven years, but really into the public consciousness in the last two or three years. These new sources of data are, interestingly enough, not compiled by the government, and they're not being compiled, they're not being collected and put together by scholars, by researchers like myself. They're actually being compiled uh, by news media, by journalists, uh, and by citizens groups who are recognizing the importance of the phenomenon, uh, citizens being killed by police, and they're going out and collecting data that can help answer the question, how many of these things happen each year? The way that these data are proving beneficial, the way that they're proving an advance over the, the federal government data, is that they're using new techniques, they're uh, enhancing the scope, uh, the, the overall um, uh, breadth of the data collection procedure, and they're exploring new sources of data. Yes, they, they do use police reports, uh, in essence, the, the supplementary homicide reports that the federal government uses, but they also, uh, in these new sources of data, dig deeper. Uh, they go out and collect data on witness statements so that they're able to determine things like whether or not the individual who was shot uh, was armed or not, or whether the individual resisted. Uh, these journalists and citizens group are also going on collection, collecting data from regional news outlets. Uh, typically, when citizens shoot and kill a, uh, when, excuse me, when police shoot and kill a citizen, uh, it will make the local newspaper. It will make the local news. Uh, it's newsworthy. Uh, but that said, the local departments don't necessarily have any obligation to subsequently report that to the FBI at the end of the year. Uh, so these, me uh, these media folks, uh, these citizen groups are going to uh, newspaper archives, uh, they're researching uh, news media resources, and they're counting up more accurately the number of these uh, citizen incidents in which uh, a citizen is killed by police. Uh, we refer to these types of uh, new sources of data more broadly as open source reporting projects. And there are several here in the United States. Uh, but the big three uh, that I'll talk about here in a minute produce some very shocking estimates of the number of citizens killed by police. For now, I'll just show you uh, the data for 2015. Um, and I'll show you data from three different sources. Uh, the first source is the Washington Post, uh, which is a major newspaper here in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, using the new techniques I described on the previous slide, uh, the Washington Post estimates uh, 975 citizens. Uh, killed by police each year. Uh, the Guardian, another international newspaper, uh, has a slightly higher estimate, uh, 1,145. Uh, and then lastly, uh, killedbypolice.net, uh, one of the earlier uh, and smaller groups to study this subject, uh, estimates even more, 1,186. Uh, while these are still just estimates, because full data are not available uh, for the entire United States, they do provide much more valid and much more reliable measures of how many citizens are killed by police in America. What we see immediately is that the numbers presented by the federal government, 200 to 500, or as I said in my textbook, you know, 150 to 250, uh, or about that, uh, those are much, much lower than what reality is. There are many, many citizens who are shot and killed by police in America. Now, the question becomes, is this a phenomenon unique to the United States of America? Are police shootings uh, at an incredibly high level here uh, and not in other places, or is this pretty much standard practice for policing uh, in the world? Well, the only way to answer that question is to make some cross-national comparisons. And I'm going to go through these pretty quick because you'll always have the ability to click through these slides later and, and look closely at the data. Um, what we're going to make here, what in America we would call an apples to oranges comparison. These are not direct comparisons across nationally. At least we can't make them directly because the populations of the places we're comparing are drastically different. The United States has 360 million folks. 
Uh, England and Wales only has 56.9 million. So England and Wales is much smaller. We would expect there to be fewer shootings. Uh, how many fewer? Well, we would have to dig a little deeper and, and, and produce some actual estimates. Uh, but this comparison clearly shows that police killings of citizens are much higher in America. Uh, 50, uh, 55 police shootings in the last 24 years in England and Wales. 59 in the first 24 days of the United States. Uh, a little bit of math in our heads shows us that, well, America has considerably, considerably more police shootings and killings of citizens than England and Wales. In fact, um, a recent report in The Economist uh, estimated that uh, British police fired their weapons, that is, they shot a weapon, fired a bullet out of their weapon, uh, a sum total of three times in the year 2013. Uh, and that's half as many shots as a single year 2014 incident in Ferguson, Missouri, a very famous incident in which an unarmed black teenager named Michael Brown was shot six times by a single police officer and killed. So in America, one incident produced more shots fired than an entire year of policing in British, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, we can make some other quick cross-national comparisons, uh, Germany to the United States. Uh, in Germany, uh, there were 15 citizens of any race, either armed or unarmed, who were fatally shot in a two-year period from 2010 to 2011. Uh, in the United States, again, a much larger country, there were 19 unarmed black men fatally shot by the police in the first five months of 2015. Again, evidence that there are many more police killings of citizens in the U.S. Uh, how we can compare, uh, we can now compare Australia and the United States. Uh, Australia has a obviously much smaller population, it's a much different country, but these numbers are still somewhat informative. There were 94 fatal police shootings in Australia between 1992 and 2011. Uh, there were 97 in March 2015 alone in the United States of America. So just these quick comparisons reveal that serious uh, issues uh, are present with the number of citizens killed relative to other countries uh, around the world. But again, we're comparing the United States, uh, which is a much larger country in terms of population than places like Great Britain, um, places like Australia and Germany. So let's make more uh, direct comparisons. Let's compare uh, regions of America that are, in essence, populated with the same number of citizens as regions of other parts of the country. Um, for example, let's, let's not compare Canada to the entire United States, but let's compare Canada just to one state, one of the larger states, uh, but a single state indeed of California. Canada has 35.2 million citizens. California has slightly more than that at 38.8 million. But Canada estimates approximately 25 fatal police shootings a year for an entire nation of 35 million people. California, a uh, single state of 38.8 million, had 70 Two. So approximately three times more shootings uh, in comparable, uh, comparably populated locations. Uh, we can compare Iceland. This is one of my favorite comparisons. Uh, Iceland is a population uh, in its entirety of, of about 323,000 residents. Uh, Stockton, California, a single city in California, has about 300,000. So again, not exactly the same, but still close. Uh, we see that in Iceland, there's been one fatal police shooting in the 71 years of Iceland's existence. Uh, Stockton, California, had three fatal police shootings in the first five months of the year 2015. So what we see is that America has considerably more citizens shot and killed by the police annually than virtually any of her other peer nations. And, and the difference uh, in numbers of shootings are stark. They are substantial. So the question that we have to ask as social scientists, uh, as criminologists, as citizens of the country I reside in, the United States of America, why are there so many police killings in America? Is it simply that American police officers are more brutal, uh, are more violent, uh, and thus they act more violently and brutally and, and engage in lethal force more often against citizens? Or is it a combination of other factors? As a sociologist, um, which is what criminologists in essence are, uh, I am required to explore a, a, a wide array of potential explanations. Uh, it's not simply uh, we are more brutal, we are more violent. It's not simply um, we don't care about our citizens as much. There are many factors at play here, at least I would argue there are. And some of the ones I would like to present to you 
Um, and I, I won't be able to definitively demonstrate cause and effect relationships, but I, but I will be making an argument that, that there are many factors at play when we try to understand how America has come to have so many citizens killed by its police. And the first is simply America is a country, it's a nation, uh, with very high levels of, of crime and violence. Um, we can look at America relative to other nations and see that crime is indeed higher. It may simply be that due to high levels of crime, the police are responding naturally and shooting and killing more dangerous uh, citizens, more dangerous criminals who, who pose a threat to both police officers themselves and to the citizens of the United States of America. So, in fact, the number of police shootings may be something that is completely explainable and justifiable to do very high levels of crime and violence. Uh, again, we don't want officers uh, being slaughtered by our citizens. Uh, we want them to have the ability to defend themselves and defend the public. And, and maybe if crime is so high in America that they just simply need to, to exert that lethal force more often. We'll explore that uh, a little bit here in a minute. Uh, another big explanation, I would argue, and I think it's clear, uh, truly has some impact, is the number of guns in the United States of America. Most Europeans are aware that Americans are in love with their firearms. Uh, we have many, many guns here. Guns are a key part of our culture, our political landscape. Uh, unquestionably, guns will play a role. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then lastly, I would argue that there's some unique elements of American policing, uh, of American police culture. And importantly, how that culture leads to less than ideal, in fact, poor relationships between police and the citizens that they serve. Um, a lack of empathy, a lack of understanding, a great deal of fear and mistrust, uh, both on the parts of police and the parts of the citizens they serve. So all three of these things uh, sort of work together and along with a variety of other factors, I would argue, contribute to why there are so many police killings in America. Let's, let's begin, however, with the first, uh, crime and violence in America. Most, most Europeans uh, and even most Americans are aware that America does have higher levels of crime than most European uh, peer nations. Well, we can illustrate that rather quickly by looking at some of those what are called uniform crime reporting data, uh, and the actual document those data get reported in is, is a document called Crime in the United States. Um, the data I'll share with you today uh, are from the year 2014. Uh, in the year 2014, there were uh, approximately 1.16 million violent crimes reported by law enforcement officers uh, and included in the document crime in the United States. Now, the UCR data, the crime in the United States document, only includes incidents reported to police and subsequently recorded by police. We know in America that crime reporting rates, even for serious violence, are slightly less than 50%. So this 1.16 million value only represents crimes uh, that were reported and that law enforcement knows about. So the true number is actually much, much higher. Uh, most crime in America doesn't get reported, largely because many Americans don't believe that the system can do much about the crimes that have occurred. Uh, we can then sort of break it down into uh, some different uh, types. Uh, this sort of is a little bit out of order, um, but the majority of violent crimes uh, are aggravated assaults. Um, then we see robberies at 28%, rapes at 7.2%, and then lastly, uh, perhaps the most validly measured of all of our different uh, measures of violent crime in America, murder at 1.2%. Um, how many murders were there in America in 2014? There were 14,249, and that equates to a murder rate uh, of 4.5 murders for every 100,000 persons. So, Basically, what the data indicate is that there is a great deal of violence in the United States and violent crime. Uh, and again, these are crimes that only the police and law enforcement know about. Uh, the actual numbers are, are probably much, much higher, uh, except in the case of homicide, because generally homicides do get reported to the police. The, the presence of a dead body tends to generate uh, notifications to police officers. Um, we can also take a look at arrests. Um, one of the things that would help explain a high number of police shootings is if citizens and police are interacting through the arrest process at a very high level um, in, in um, very often. And as a result of those many interactions, uh, violence is, is going to be more likely to occur. So, again, we can go back to the crime of the United States data. 
Uh, and what we can see is that in 2014, uh, the police made uh, about 11.2 million arrests. Uh, about 4.5% of those arrests were for violent crimes, 13.9% were for property crimes. Uh, of those people arrested, 73% were male. So what this indicates is that the police are interacting with citizens very, very often uh, for incidents uh, involving crime and, and in an arrest uh, procedure, in an arrest engagement. Uh, these undoubtedly create numerous opportunities in which dangerous citizens, uh, citizens who want to do harm to the police or do harm to society as, as a whole, um, uh, those incidents are going to create a high number of uh, of police uses of force against citizens, and unfortunately, a high number uh, of uses of force that involve lethal violence. Um, we can look a little bit more closely at the arrest data. The most uh, common type of arrests for drug use, there were about 1.5 million of those. Uh, theft was next. And then lastly, drunk driving. Um, again, what these data indicate is that, yes, crime and violence are very high in the United States, uh, and also that the police are interacting with uh, violent criminals at, at a very common uh, and a very high rate. Uh, what we now need to do, though, is, is try to compare crime in the United States to, to crime in other places. We need to make some cross-national crime comparisons. Um, those can be difficult to do. Um, comparing crime in, in America to the various nations of Europe or Africa or Asia can be difficult, um, and, and notoriously so, because of the way crime is measured differently, because of the way data are collected differently, uh, it, it can be a difficult task. The good news is that we can very easily, however, make cross-national comparisons for the crime of homicide. Homicide uh, data generally translate relatively well cross-nationally. So if we say that America is a very violent country, one way to compare its levels of violence to other countries is to compare murder rates cross-nationally. So what we have here uh, is a cross-national homicide uh, rate comparison for year 2011 data. What we see immediately, what jumps out immediately, is that the United States has a much, much higher homicide rate than her peer nations. Uh, in fact, uh, I did a little digging, and I found that uh, for your nation, Spain, in 2012, uh, the murder rate was 0.8 per 100,000. The United States was about 45 uh, 4.7-ish. So much, much, much higher levels of lethal violence in America. Americans are murdering each other at a much higher clip. Uh, we're a more violent country. Again, that could account for some of why there are more lethal shootings. If our criminals are more violent, if they're more lethal, if they're more deadly, then the police would be expected to use deadly force more often. That is unquestionably part of the picture. Again, simply put, America has considerably higher rates of crime and violence than her peer nations. And, and undoubtedly, this fact is going to play some role in the high number of American citizens killed by our police. But it's not the only factor. It's not simply America's level of violence. We also have to take a look at the number of guns in American society. Guns change situations. Guns change circumstances. Uh, if I attack you with a knife, if I attack you with my fists, uh, it is a different attack than if I attack you with a firearm. Firearms are, simply put, more lethal. They facilitate uh, the transmission of lethal violence. Yes, I can stab someone to death with a knife, but it is much more difficult than it is to shoot them with a firearm. So we have to quickly take a look at how guns play a role, and, and that's what we can do now. now uh, guns are very common in America, and I have some data to show you uh, the prevalence of firearms here in the United States. In fact, this chart, which is one of my favorite charts uh, of all time, although it's also a, a very sad chart, I think, uh, and one that I'm not proud of to have my nation uh, included within, uh, is this idea that at present, uh, estimates suggest that there are more guns in the United States of America than there are American citizens. Uh, in fact, in about 2008, around that period, uh, the number of guns uh, that exist here, these are handguns, long guns, rifles, shotguns, etc., uh, actually began to outnumber the American uh, number of American citizens. We have many, many, many guns. And again, guns change interactions uh, between police and citizens uh, and between criminals and the police. It's well between criminals and other citizens. So many, many guns here in the United States. Uh, we can look at gun ownership. Uh, it's not simply the number of firearms, but how many people actually own guns. Uh, in 
These data, what you can see is that uh, at present, or as close to present as these data indicate, uh, household gun ownership, that is uh, the number of households that own a gun, is about 31%. Approximately one in three American households has a gun in it. Uh, that can be a firearm, that can be a long gun, uh, a rifle, a shotgun, but 31% of Americans' uh, households own firearms. Now, what's interesting is that the actual percentage of household ownership has actually been on the decline for the past 30 years. That's largely because Americans are increasing uh, urban um, living. We're more, more and more moving into the cities. We're leaving rural areas. Uh, those people who live in rural uh, areas tend to have more firearms, uh, easier access to firearms. They need firearms. Hunting is more common uh, in rural areas, etc. Uh, so we are seeing a decline uh, in household ownership. But there are still many, many guns. In fact, when we look at gun ownership at a personal level, the actual ownership individually of a firearm, uh, a little over one in five Americans report personally owning a gun. And when we see this chart, what we see is that the personal ownership rates, uh, while declining a little bit, have remained much, much more stable over time. Uh, a lot of Americans own firearms. Uh, in fact, uh, there are going to be a lot of firearms out there uh, being produced for Americans to purchase and own in the future. Uh, this chart quickly shows you some data on how many guns are being manufactured in the United States over time. Uh, in fact, in 2013, we saw the highest number of guns manufactured since uh, the the, the mid-1980s. A lot of this increase in gun manufacturing is a result of uh, gun manufacturers and citizens responding to President Obama's administration and their efforts to try to uh, curb uh, citizens' ability to access certain types of firearms, particularly assault rifles and other highly lethal forms of firearms. In response to government, if you will, crackdowns on uh, gun ownership, uh, which have been greatly uh, blown out of proportion by, by people who are in support of guns, in response to a perceived crackdown, I guess that's the best way to put it, uh, Americans have demanded uh, the marketplace produce more guns for them to purchase. There will be uh, no shortage of guns in America for the foreseeable future. Uh, they are out there, uh, they are in the hands of citizens, and they will be for a very, very long time. Uh, what happens with these guns? If they sat in people's uh, closets, if they were locked away in cases, uh, if they were simply put on the wall as a decoration, then, then guns wouldn't be a very uh, important issue in terms of crime and justice. Uh, but that's not what they're used for. American firearms uh, are used to kill other Americans. Uh, we pointed out, I pointed out earlier, that America has very high levels of homicide, and that's true. But what really differentiates America, what really makes her stand out from her peer nation, is her lethal firearm violence. Uh, this chart shows us homicides by weapon type uh, for the period 1980 to 2008. And what you see clearly is that American homicide is dominated by handgun murders. Uh, the guns that are in the possession of Americans are used at a very high level uh, for killing other Americans. Uh, we use guns, our criminals use weapons to kill other Americans. They facilitate the killing. Uh, sometimes that, that killing can be intentional. Uh, I get a gun and I want to kill you, so I do kill you. But other times, uh, it's the increased lethality of weapons that leads to a homicide. I, I intended to scare you with a gun. I intended to wound you with a gun, but I inadvertently killed you. Guns are simply put more lethal. So the idea here is that there are many guns in America uh, in the hands of private citizens, and they're being used by criminals to kill other Americans. That makes American criminals more lethal, more dangerous. And a natural police response to that increased risk, that increased lethality, is to perhaps use lethal force more often. Americans are packing heat, as we would say in America. We are armed, and thus a police response to citizens who they encounter uh, during the commission of violent crimes or property crimes might be one uh, that lends itself to using more lethal violence. Again, if American citizens are violent, maybe the police are correct to respond in kind, to respond with a greater deal of violence. Um, but what about other countries? We can take a look at some cross-national gun homicides. I said earlier that what makes America truly unique 
is her lethal firearm violence. Well, we know America has more murders than other nations comparable to her, uh, but it also has considerably more gun-related murders. When we look uh, at these data, we see America's uh, gun homicide rate uh, at about 3.25 for 100,000 residents. Uh, and as a point of comparison, Spain's, which we see here in the middle of the chart, is about 0.25 gun homicides for every 100,000 people. Uh, Chile is uh, the next closest to the United States, but even but even then, America far outpaces uh, other nations in terms of lethal firearm violence. Again, we are dangerous as citizens to each other and to our police, so maybe the large number of citizens killed by police is simply a response to that increased citizen dangerousness, uh, that high level of firearm threat that American citizens pose. Uh, complicating matters is the idea that not just criminals carry and possess firearms in, in, in America. Uh, we have something called concealed carry. In fact, uh, just recently, the final state, my state, Illinois, uh, became the 50th United State, uh, United States state to pass a law allowing qualified individuals, you have to pass a test and pay a fee, to carry certain concealed firearms in public. Now what we have here is a picture of what this looks like. Americans are allowed to legally carry guns concealed beneath their shirts, in their purses, uh, in specialized holsters underneath their arms uh, for self-defense. The idea is that by carrying a firearm in a concealed manner, you will add uh, a level of deterrence, you will be able to protect yourself, you will make the world safer. Well, that may be true. The data are definitely mixed. Um, but the more Americans that are out there carrying guns, the greater threat they pose to police. Uh, and police don't always know who's carrying a gun because of its concealed nature of carrying. Uh, what's interesting is that some states in America, Texas is a good example, even permits open carry. Uh, we see here examples of open carry. Uh, rifles on the backs of individuals ordering American fast food. Uh, a, a holster on the outside uh, of a belt. Here uh, we have a, an individual with an interesting We the People tattoo uh, and a old-style six-shooter uh, like the Great American Old West. Americans are carrying firearms. Uh, and they're doing so at a good clip. And again, police are aware of this fact. How many citizens carry guns? Well, a an online gr a group uh, that posts data regularly online, the Crime Research Prevention Center, a, a pro-gun organization, uh, estimates a total of about 13.3 million concealed carry permits have been issued in the United States. Uh, what they do demonstrate also is that the number of concealed permits is increasing substantially. Uh, there have been more than 1.7 million new permits in the last year. Um, approximately 5.4% of the total adult population has a permit. And what we see is that uh, there are some states even where more than 10% of the adult population has a concealed permit. Uh, overall, I think the data clearly indicate that America has a relationship with guns uh, and that that relationship with guns influences the number of citizens who are killed by police. Uh, citizens are a greater threat. Police respond in kind. Uh, armed individuals are simply more dangerous. And again, increased lethal violence by police might be a rational response. But it would really only be rational if the police are facing a high level of risk. That is, if the police are facing risk from these firearms, if citizens' owner ownership of guns increases the likelihood that the police will be shot and killed, then and only then will lethal violence by police against citizens be justified. Well, if we take a look at the number of police killed by citizens uh, from 1965 to 2015, uh, what we see is that the total number of officer uh, fatalities, the number of officer deaths while on duty, has declined substantially. Uh, in fact, this green arrow right here, uh, the green star, excuse me, the green star, represents the peak number of officers who were shot and killed by citizens. That happened in about 1972, I believe. Uh, there were 156 officers shot and killed. At present, in 2015, there were only 42 firearm-related fatalities. That is a 26% decline over the number of officer firearm-related fatalities for the past decade. So overall, police are safer than they've ever been in the United States. Fewer and fewer and fewer the, of them are being killed, shot and killed, by citizens. Now, if that's the case, 
that translates into a lower risk of death for police on an annual basis. And yet, the data indicate that the number of police uses of lethal violence against citizens is actually remaining the same, or in some case, uh, some cases even increasing. Uh, we can make a couple comparisons. For example, uh, the number of citizens killed by police in 2015 was 1,145, police killed by citizens, 42. A huge difference. What's really disturbing is that the number of unarmed citizens killed by police, those are individuals that did not possess the ability to exert lethal violence in a very uh, easy manner, the number of unarmed citizens killed is 226. That's about 20% of all the citizens who were killed in 2015. Equally disturbing is that approximately half of those 20%, or a total of 111, were minorities, blacks or Hispanics. Um, the last thing I really want to talk about uh, in terms of trying to account for why there are such a high number of fatal police uh, encounters with citizens in America is the unique nature of policing in America. I'm going to quickly look at some statistics. There's about 12,000 local police departments in the United States as of 2013, uh, a total of about 810,000 officers who have general arrest powers. Uh, of American police, about one quarter, 23% are minorities. That's less than the uh, proportion of minorities in the general population, uh, but it's still comparable. Uh, and about 13% or one in eight are female police. Uh, only one third of police agencies require their officers to possess a college degree, however. Uh, many officers go into the job after military experience, so a great deal of our new officers uh, are uh, veterans uh, who are returning from combat in places like Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, and thus uh, are used to being in environments with a great deal of danger uh, and where lethal violence may in fact be necessary. Um, when we look at American police culture, we see some unique attributes. Um, American policing uh, is clearly... Um, has clearly created a, a, a subculture uh, that researchers, psychologists, and, and criminal justice researchers um, have measured uh, and can identify by certain measurable attributes, things like cynicism, things like clannishness, secrecy, the mistrust of citizens. Police do not trust American citizens, and in fact, many American citizens do not trust the police. Uh, the level of secrecy that the police have, they, they don't share information. Um, what this subculture does is it insulates police from other members of society. It creates what American criminal justice researchers have referred to as a blue curtain effect. Uh, officers are isolated from society. They lose empathy. They lose interaction. They lose uh, any sense of caring or trust with citizens. And in fact, citizens lose the same things. The police become a marginalized group. Uh, and the police, in their own minds, marginalize citizens. They believe that they're all dangerous. They fear citizens, uh, especially African-American male citizens. Um, this is a negative thing about American policing. It makes it difficult for the police to encounter citizens in one-on-one -on -one confrontations and not be afraid and not be distrustful. And fear and mistrust lead to an increased use of lethal violence, particularly when you consider the fact that many American citizens are armed, many criminals are armed. Um, and police are armed as well, lethal violence is a natural outcome. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the beliefs of the police, sub police subculture, uh, the idea that no one understands police work uh, in terms of what it really is in America except for the police, the idea that loyalty matters the most, uh, the idea that it's impossible to fight crime without bending and breaking rules, uh, the idea that the public is unsupportive of police, and the idea that the public is unreasonably demanding. Um, these are all elements that create mistrust and apprehension between the police and the citizens they serve, and again, harm the relationship between the police and the public. Uh, when we look at how citizens react to this police subculture, what we see is that overall, Americans do not have a great deal of confidence in their police. Yes, levels of confidence have remained relatively stable over time, but only approximately 52% as of 2015 reported either a great deal of confidence or quite a lot of confidence in their police. When you consider police possess a state-sanctioned right to use lethal force, it's important that citizens trust those police, that when the police ask them to do things, that citizens recognize, I trust you and I will comply.
when citizens are afraid of police, when they don't trust the police, and the police are afraid of and don't trust citizens, the, the likelihood of a lethal encounter increases substantially. Uh, we can look at confidence by gender and race. Uh, nationally, uh, confidence has declined in the last several years as police shootings have become more and more covered by mass media, newspapers, and television. Uh, what's especially disturbing uh, are how minorities express confidence in the police or fail to express confidence in the police. As of 2014, black Americans, less than one in third, uh, less than one in three, excuse me, uh, uh, express confidence in American police. Now, overall, this confidence is, uh, the lack of confidence is understandable, uh, particularly as it pertains to the way police react to incidents in which they kill a citizen. Um, some incidents of police shootings, of police killing citizens, are clearly justified. There are instances when the police defend themselves, when they use lethal violence to protect citizens, and we want them to do that. That's ideal. But there are also incidents in which the police shoot and kill citizens uh, illegally. And the question is, how does Americans, America's criminal justice system respond to those incidents? Well, since 2005, there have been approximately, estimates, uh, say about 10,000 American citizens killed by the police. And that's a low estimate, but approximately 10,000. So similarly, the estimates will suggest anywhere between 800 to 2,000 of those killings involved an unarmed citizen, the police killing an unarmed person, someone who could not present a threat of lethal violence to police, yet they were shot and killed anyway. Many of those incidents, some of them at least, had to be unjustified. Unquestionably, and the data and the case file suggest that they were. So the question becomes, when these unjustified killings ha uh, happen, how does the system respond? In particular, how many of the officers involved in those shootings are convicted of murder? Now, the answer is that since 2005, when an estimated 800 to 2,000 unarmed Americans were shot and killed by their police, only 13 officers were convicted of murder. And many times, those sentences that those officers received were very, very minor. So overall, the public doesn't have a great deal of confidence that the police will police themselves. They don't believe that uh, the police, when they engage in wrongdoing, that is, when the police engage in illegal behavior, that anything bad will happen to them. And that is evidenced by the fact that such a tiny fraction of police officers uh, are actually ever convicted of murder. Uh, it's a major problem in American society. Um, in terms of convictions, the good news for American citizens is that the number of prosecutions uh, attempts to hold the police accountable actually have increased over the past several years. But unfortunately, uh, very few cases uh, that are brought forward by prosecutors um, actually result in a conviction, as the data from the previous slide suggested. Uh, some summary and concluding remarks. I've gone a little over my 40-minute period. Uh, what I hope you took away from this is that uh, the use of lethal force by police against citizens in America is unique to the United States and our system. Uh, it is problematic, but it is something that we are on an annual basis learning more about, and hopefully we can use our social science researchers along with our journalists and our citizens groups, and we can face this problem head on and, and try to solve it. Um, what I find interesting is that each year, uh, and over the past several years, thousands of Americans have been killed by police without the benefit of trial or due process. Um, and yet, as a nation, the United States is slowly moving towards the abolition of the death penalty because we don't believe that even convicted offenders should be executed. Um, my state, in particular, Illinois, has abolished the death penalty. There is no death penalty here. So what we see is an abolition of the death penalty after extensive due process trial procedures, uh, appeals, enormous investment of time and energy to protect the rights uh, of the individuals charged, but thousands of American citizens who've been convicted of no crime being, in essence, executed by their police with no trial or due process. We have two very different processes operating, um, and largely that's because Americans have been unaware how many citizens are killed annually. New data sources are changing that, and I believe that in the future, uh, we will do a much better job 
uh, controlling the way police lethal violence is actually exercised. Uh, how do you solve it? Well, that's a very complex problem. Uh, it's going to require changes in police training, uh, police policy, police culture, police practice. Unfortunately, guns in America are going nowhere. Uh, as I showed earlier, there are more and more being manufactured every year. America will be uh, full of guns for the next century. Um, but we can change the way citizens view police. We can change the way police view citizens. And we can do that through changes to policy, culture, and practice. And ideally, as we continue to study this issue, um, what we will see is that five, ten years down the road, uh, lethal police violence was not going to be as big of a problem as it is today. As I said, the first step for that is to adequately and effectively measure how often it happens and then try to understand why. And I've presented what I believe are a few explanations for that. Thank you very much uh, for your time. That's all the remarks I have. Uh, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak with you. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, I love Spain. I love Valencia. Uh, I love your university. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Do you have any questions uh, for me? If you do, uh, you're welcome to type them in. And I will uh, be happy to try to answer them. In particular, if there's anything uh, in the data you would like me to go back to, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and in fact, I should have given you my, my email address uh, in the presentation. I'd be more than happy to accept questions later on uh, via email. My, my email address is uh, sschn3 at uis dot edu. I will quickly type it into the uh, text window so you can see it. And then that way, you're welcome to email me, and I would be happy to answer your questions uh, by email. Um, I can also uh, give you my telephone number. Uh, I would be more than happy to accept any uh, phone calls from you. Uh, I think uh, if you would like to ask a, a question and you were only able to hear the presentation on your own time, um, I'd be more than happy to give you my office number and uh, we could maybe uh, converse over the phone. Happy to share that as well. Again, I really appreciate the time you've taken uh, to sit and listen to me. I hope you found the presentation interesting. Um, America is a very rich place to study criminology and criminal justice. Uh, unfortunately, one of the reasons is because we have so much crime and violence and guns. Um, we still have the death penalty, although it's declining. Uh, it's, a, it's a rich, ripe area for studying criminal justice. Okay, we have a question. In England, the police don't use guns. Uh, here is, but the change is slow. Yeah, I think um, England is a, is a really interesting example uh, of policing uh, in a different way than, than American policing. Um, England's police are much more under the control of, of citizens. Um, there are what are called civilian review boards in England, whose job it is to evaluate the police annually. Uh, they even do things like set the salary of the police chief. Uh, so in England, the, the police are far more answerable to citizens. Citizens actually have a seat at the table for police decision-making. And thus, 
uh, the, 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 the unwillingness to use firearms, the, the lesser use of violence is, is a natural, uh, outgrowth of the fact that, that police, uh, can be held accountable by the citizens they serve. America, that's not necessarily the case. And in many other places, the police, uh, in America have some degree, uh, of, of, oversight placed upon them by the government, undoubtedly, and, and an even less amount by the citizens they serve. Uh, as I said earlier, the police culture is very secretive. When things go wrong in policing, the police uh, close the doors uh, and they uh, close the blinds and they don't let information out. And in essence, they don't share information because they know that they don't have to. Uh, citizens can't access information. Citizens have no seat at the table for decision making. Um, and one of the things that needs to change in America is we must make our police accountable to the citizens they serve more effectively. Um, whether that means uh, getting citizen input on uh, the nature of police firearms and their use, uh, mandating less lethal forms of police weaponry, things like uh, electric tasers, um, or other types of non-lethal sources. Um, again, firearms are a unique attribute of American society and American culture and American policing. Uh, on my campus, uh, as I'm sitting here in my office right now, I can look out the window and see a police car. A police who, who police the UIS campus uh, carry firearms, pistols on their sides, and they also have shotguns in the car. They are armed and ready to shoot criminals. Uh, I would argue that you do not need an armed police force on a college campus. Um, Americans don't feel that way. Um, there aren't instances in which the police always need to be armed. That said, America also is moving towards allowing students to carry firearms in the classroom. Uh, universities across America have allowed their students to bring guns to class concealed, but bring guns to class. So we have had many shootings in universities uh, over the past 10 years, and many argue that the police on a campus do need to be armed. They do need to have the ability to use lethal force. Uh, at the very least, it, it's something worth debating.